Hi, I'm Jim Hermiller. I'm from St. Vincent Ascension in Indianapolis, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to this webinar. I think it promises to be an extraordinary one. Um, this is in large part due to the fact we've got two Hall of Fame panelists tonight. We're going to really talk about the amulet, how to use it, what are the implications of how it's able to close the appendage. We have Chris Ellis, who comes to us from Vanderbilt, and we also have DJ Lacaretti, who comes to us from uh, the Kansas City Heart Rhythm um, Institute. DJ is going to talk about LAA closure definitions and correlations with outcomes. Chris is going to talk about really using the amulet. What are the best practices to get the best closures and the safest closures? And we'll have a lot of time for panel discussion. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. The webinar is going to be recorded, so you can uh, really get it on demand later. Uh, submit your questions. We'll answer them as we go along. And then there's going to be a survey to fill out afterwards. We really appreciate it so we can get feedback about how to improve the program. So here's the amulet. As you can see, it has a lobe and a disc. And it's really a dual seal, seal technology. And it results in durable superior closing results. And we'll talk about those. Uh, it's designed for versatility with respect to treating the widest variety of uh, geometries and sizes of the appendage irregardless um, of uh, the depth. And then there's immediate freedom from having to use oral anticoagulants afterwards and just dual antiplatelet therapy for the antithrombotic regimen. So without uh, further ado, we're gonna turn it over to DJ, who's gonna talk to us about understanding device leaks after LA appendage closure. DJ. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harmiller, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so, uh, I think a lot of you have heard much about the amulet IDE economy results and, and what has been presented at ESC, then our subsequent paper in circulation. And this really opened up a lot of debate on what exactly is the, is the difference between all these different type of devices that are available, and then this plethora of data that's coming out, and people are looking at PEEs, people are looking at CT scans, and and you have a new definition of a leak, and the way people look at it is different. Um, so we thought it would be nice to really focus on this aspect of leaks and point out some fundamental differences in how uh, these two devices play that are currently available in the market, the Watchman device and the amulet device, as it pertains to their ability to close the left atrial appendage. And that's the reason why I titled my talk, Separating Wheat from Shaft, Understanding What Really is relevant from something that is not relevant. I see that uh, the voice was a little bit warbled earlier. Uh, do you guys hear me well? Perfect. You sound good, DJ. All right, excellent. So uh, let me see. I think I was going in the wrong direction. And so let's talk a little bit about what exactly is a leak, right? So in its purest definition, an active unprotected communication between the left atrial body and the left atrial appendage that is present beyond the left atrial appendage of the can be defined as a true leak because that's what really matters and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid, thereby we can mitigate the risk of embolization of a thrombus that's present deep inside the body of the left atrial appendage. So this entire idea of the left atrial appendage occlusion that was initially put forth by Michael Lesh, subsequently worked on by um, for Seward and, uh, um, and the others that followed, including David Holmes and others, we wanted to design a device to really occlude the appendage so that the body of this device comes in contact with the wall of the left atrial appendageal ostium, and thereby it closes it off, promotes a neoendothelialization, and thereby we can mitigate the potential risk of thrombus formation behind, and even if, and then subsequent migration of this um, uh, material out into the systemic circulation, thereby we can mitigate the risk of systemic thromboembolic events. And that's basically the premise of the design of any study that's out there. So before we get to the idea of a leak, I think it's, it's important to understand what does it mean to have permeability across the left atrial appendage of Pluto, right? 
So we know that the, the little fabric that's present, the PTFE fabric that's present inside the body of these devices is permeable nowadays. And when you dial back a few years behind to the early days of left atrial appendage occlusion, that is the days of plate in early 2002, 2003, 2004, these devices did not have a permeable membrane. And as a result of which, these devices were also less compliant. Loading was harder. Retractability was harder because the non-permeable tissue has completely different tensile strengths. And it's hard to visualize the device positions in relative to the left atrial appendage lumen and the body on angiography. And you cannot quite assess the compression or other stability related factors, right? These are all the issues they figured out on the very first generation plated device. And then the concept of permeable membrane within these appendage occluders really came to the forefront where you have a much compliant device, it's easily visualized, you can assess the stability factors a lot better, and it has a similar ability to prevent clot out of the left atrial appendage, and that also formed the basis of patentability of the Watchman's um, uh, design, right? So once you kind of get an idea of this, then it really starts sinking in in terms of what exactly does it really mean by a leak, just because a blood can pass through this permeable mesh, it doesn't mean that there is a leak. A leak is truly a gap in the space between the tissue of the left atrial appendage body and the edge of the device is what it truly is. So with that in mind, you can say, what is a good closure for the left atrial appendage, right? You have the stability criteria, which is the close criteria for the amulets and the pass criteria for the watchman device. And then all of us are looking for the circumferential contact of the device with all the LA walls 100% and no visible gaps between the LA wall and the device. So how exactly do you assist during the procedure, right? So intraoperatively, we have fluoroscopy and a little contrast that we could use to really see if there's an open communication, right? It can mostly discern a true gap or a peri-device leak, and it's mostly two-dimensional. And it's hard to exactly localize where exactly your leak is when you're doing a fluoro contrast injection, right? Because contrast can flow through the device and it sometimes can look like it's occluded, but you can't quite truly say whether the device is in true contact with the wall or not. You can have sort of gross estimate of what it is, right? And that's kind of where the transesophageal echo, which has historically been used in assessing the left atrial appendage for the presence or absence of clots before cardioversions. And this is kind of, this tool has been around for more than a decade prior to the advancement of the percutaneous appendage closure devices, right? So we really figured out checking the left atrial appendage for thrombus and making sure we rule it out before cardioversion. And that's, that was a natural automatic transition. As we adapted this particular procedure and PE really became a very convenient intra-procedural tool for us to enable us to how we figure out how we implant this, right? You can mostly discern a true leak or a gap. You can see the blood flow through the device, through around the device because there is no blood flow through the device. So. Truly, if there is a gap between the wall of the appendage and the device, you can actually tell it based on the TE, and it sort of kind of became the gold standard for us one way or the other, right? So that's how the definition and the use of the transesophageal echo really came into being, and as a result of which, a leak around the device, which is the peri device leak, is what is defined by the transesophageal echo photograph. It cannot discern flow of blood through the mesh of the device. And then subsequently we introduced the ice, it's more recent, but again, it's limited in its views, it's cumbersome. We, a lot of us have adapted ice because of number one, out of necessity, you don't have PE operators to support it. Sometimes you may not have general anesthesia. And then it's really gaining quick momentum because it, it, it rules out your dependency on another operator to help you with it, even though visualization may be very nice with the transesophageal echocardiogram when it is properly done by the right people. So, and then came across this whole issue of the permeability of the left atrial appendage occluders, and then the comparison in terms of follow-up, right? So how do we really follow up these patients? You have the traditional transesophageal echo, a lot of experience, and 
uh, as of course, we do agree that there are some blind spots in between your zero degree to 45 to 90 to 135. There are certain areas that are sort of, we have a blind spot, but again, when you really put all of these views together, you have a pretty reasonably thorough understanding of what exactly is happening, whether you have a true Perry device leak or not. And this can help us to define the presence or absence of thrombus to some degree, but sometimes it could be tricky. Um, but then again, it cannot confirm the neoendothelialization of the device because transesophageal echocardiograms do not tell you much about what happens because it, it cannot discern the flow through the device, right? And so as the CT angiography really became popular in, in the cardiology world, we started adapting CT angiography, right? I mean, so many of us started doing CTs post-procedure for follow-up. It's great, it's non-invasive, but again, there's a bit of exposure to contrast and radiation, limitation in patients with renal insufficiencies. And oftentimes, you really don't have a baseline intra-procedural to compare with, right? So you, you're doing your intra-procedural deployment using a transesophageal echo or an ICE, and then you are following them with the help of the CT scan. CT scans provide you a beautiful 360 degree view, no blind spots. You can definitely see the flow around the device. I mean, sometimes it could be a little nuanced, right? I mean, it's again, it all depends on how you're, you're looking at that. It can delineate whether there is endothelialization in a surrogate fashion mm -hmm. by looking for flow of contrast through that. And probably thrombus definition may be better, especially if you do delayed acquisition with an extra bolus of contrast there. So now you have two different modalities to assess your leaks. You have the transesophageal echo definition, which is the peridivized leak that we all are very familiar with. It's a singular definition. It's a leak and a communication between the left atrial body and the left atrial appendageal body on the side of the device, which is what is defined as a peridivized leak. You can have single or multiple jets. It sometimes is dependent on how you adjust your Nyquist limits. It's well tested. We've produced hundreds of papers on this. And the risk of systemic thromboembolization in the presence of a large leak is reasonably established, uh, even though uh, there are some questions about some of the early data that, that we, we, we will talk about in a second here. And then we throw the CT into the mix, and then a lot of papers came out, like defining this, this very interesting way of defining leak, right? Because what the CT and geographers believe in is the is the Hounsfield units, right? I'll show you a CT report that my colleague just recently read to me, and he defines Hounsfield units 128 in the left atrium and Hounsfield units 113 in the behind the disc, Hounsfield units of uh, 120 behind in the lobe and 100 and uh, five behind in the left atrial body. I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going bonkers, right? So what exactly does it mean to me from a clinical standpoint? It may not really mean a whole lot to me from a clinical standpoint, right? So let's take this most recent paper that came out, which is the um, the Swiss APRO, right? It's a great paper, well done. Uh, but again, the definition confuses the heck out of people. Like, for example, yes, there is a PDL, which is very similar to the, to the TE. Then they have the intra-device leak, which is contrast flow through the device filling the left atrial appendageal body. Then they have the MIL, which is the mixed leak. And then they have the PAVL, which is the patent appendage with a visible leak. What that means is contrast flows through, and you can also see a gap right around the edge of the disc and the edge of the lobe, right? And so you have PANVL, or PANVL, which is patent appendage with non-visible leak. So what they're describing here is nothing but an inter-device leak. Essentially, contrast flows through the device, through the disc, and then there is no obvious leak around the device. So, and then you have a non-patent appendage. That means the whole thing has covered the appendage and there is really no flow across. That means that appendage is completely occluded and also endothelialized completely, right? That can happen very rapidly in a few patients and they're not, not that infrequent, right? So. When people talk about leak, this is a slide I want you to put in your head and think about what modality of imaging are you using? Are you using a transesophageal echo or are you using CT scan? And when you say a leak, what exactly does it mean? To me, 
all the things that are out there in that gray box don't really matter other than the first one, which is, which is buried devisely. Everything else is garbage, right? And then we are trying to reinvent a lingo and a language that confuses the heck out of the people, right? So the implications of the so-called non-Perry device leaks is largely unknown, right? And so non-patent appendage is the best case scenario that we all want, right? We want every appendage to be closed. We want every appendage to be endothelialized so that there is no contrast flow, there is no gap, and that appendage is, is fixed and it's completely non-communicative and it's taken out of the equation from systemic circulation. And again, this definition of IDL and the PANBL is it's kind of like dancing around the issue, which are clinically irrelevant. And that's the reason why I wanted to spend a little bit of time because this is exactly where people want to go. And it's funny how this kind of becomes a fodder for the device wars that the companies play one against the other. And it's, I think it's very important for us as clinicians to really understand these two differences and really what it means from a, from a clinical standpoint. And so let's go to the next slide. So let's spend a little time on what exactly is a significant leak, right? So, and, and I mean, um, Chris is smiling because how in the world did we come up with a five millimeter leak as a cutoff, right? Like, so when all the early trials came up, we decided that five millimeters is good enough. How did we come up with a number? there was really no scientific basis for that cutoff, right? When, when a, a larger number of devi these devices got put up, the least amount of leak that one can walk away intra-procedurally, especially deploying a non-compliant device and using tools that are rudimentary and, and very primitive, we accepted five millimeters as a possible endpoint that's acceptable, right? And we kind of use it as a cutoff because we needed a cutoff of some sort. Nobody knew whether five millimeters was big enough or was, was five millimeters not small enough. So we used five millimeters. And that sort of became the industry standard for many clinical trials that subsequently happened thereafter, right? So you see a good example of what a five millimeter leak would look like. And then you would see the small leaks, which are three millimeters and zero millimeters and all of that, right? And so there is complete occlusion of that. As the world moves and becomes more sophisticated as our experience gets better, tools get better, these devices go through version one, version two, version 10, then our the ability to manufacture devices that are more confirmative to the appendageal anatomy becomes better. So as a result of which, this target should also get better, right? So what was a five millimeter target in the past is no longer acceptable. I mean, I don't think I would ever leave a device in place if I have a five millimeter leak. I don't think anybody that's out there on this panel or there in the audience would accept a five millimeter leak as, as an endpoint, right? It's kind of like, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a no brainer. But at the same time, that's the data that we have. That's a limit that we use. But so slowly the world has accepted that three millimeters is probably better than five millimeters. And in my opinion, zero millimeters is probably better than three millimeters, right? So this is kind of where we, we kind of edge into that. There are different classifications. At least this is a rough classification we at, in Kansas City use. When you have a leak of more than five millimeters, we call it a severe leak. When it's between four to five millimeters, we call it moderate. It's two to three millimeters, we call it mild. And when it's less than one, it's completely non significant Most of them because close off for a period of time. There is really not much of a concern. So it's important to go back to this fantastic paper that Randy Lee, uh, my good friend Randy Lee did in back in 2002, right? This is a paper on the Plato device. They, they took these um, um, histopathological confirmation of that, and you see the Plato device nicely sitting in there, and you have the endothelium growing over it, and so the histopathology confirms it. And then even the electron microscopy shows the mobilization of the endothelial cells, and you see this beautiful layer of contiguous endothelial cells closing off that um, piece of the plate to device, really serving the purpose the way it should be, right? So, but the fact is one has to remember, if you really focus on this particular picture on the left side, this is a Watchman device that never really endothelialized. This patient underwent heart transplantation, so uh, the heart came out. And you see this patient had significant amount of mitral regurgitation with the jet hitting that 
um, appendageal closure device really impeding the possibility of neoendothelialization. So endothelialization may not be complete in all patients by six weeks or even six months for that matter. That's something that we got to remember. But that is, does it matter? And there is no definite connection to neoendothelialization or systemic thromboembolization or DRT. I mean, it's an assumption that endothelialization is better, but there is no obvious direct connection in any of the trials that we have done so far to show that is the case. So there are several factors that impact endothelialization of a device, genetic factors. There are patients that get these devices endothelialized completely within six weeks, as I've shown you earlier. And there are patients, it takes two years, and still they, have, they still have contrast flowing through that. But does it mean that they are, they are at risk, uh, higher risk for clot formation, DRT, embolization? No. And we have seen a lot of patients where a device is completely endothelialized, and coincidentally, they get a CT scan or a TE for something else, and there is a big hunkering clot sitting on the device, right? So this assumption that somehow neoendothelialization has to complete to really prevent the risk of thromus formation is kind of ill-founded. Mitral regurgitation is a problem because it continuously washes off any amount of endothelial cells that get deposited on this device and it will prevent neoendothelialization. And we have seen this with many examples throughout. Long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is a problem because they have a very large appendages and their remodeling process continues. The, there is append the atrial as well as appendageal dilatation continues as a result of which Neoendothelialization is a problem. When you have a large surface area appendage closure device, right? So when you look at a larger watchman device or a larger disc left atrial appendage on an amulet closure device, you have much larger surface areas. It obviously requires much longer for this, for the neoendothelialization to happen. And then the amount of contact with the F left atrial appendage wall also makes a difference, right? Sometimes, when an appendage of ostium is raked up, like for example, there are occasional cases where we may do an appendage isolation and because the patient is elderly coming from hundreds of miles away, we may drop in appendage closure device at the same time. And interesting enough, these appendages actually close off much more rapidly than those that are naive and, 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 and they don't have any injuries in them. So the near endothelialization process could be a little bit different. So these are all the factors that really need to keep we have to keep in mind. So let's interpret these leaks with this information that we gained by really systematically digging deep into this. From the amulet data, on the left you have the 45 day, and on the right you have the 12 month peri device leak severity by um, Francis of Visual Echo. And what you see here is very interesting, right? So we, if you use a cutoff of about, say, three millimeters and above, in the watchman arm at 45 days, you had 26% of the patients that had a significant leak of more than three millimeters, I guess, as against 11%. And that number didn't change a whole lot, even at one year. That is 10% versus 22%. Both of them are significantly different between the two. And what you see here is also interesting. Those patients that had a complete occlusion with no peri device leak is at about 60 plus percent in the amulet arm, and, and about 43% in the um, um, uh, watchman arm. And you see a very similar rate be between the two. Uh, as actually, in the watchman arm, over a period of time, this complete occlusion really gets better. So this is something that one has to keep in mind. So a dual seal mechanism closure is obviously superior to a single seal mechanism left atrial appendage occlusion, and that is very clearly evident. And that, I think, is slightly better with the Watchman device, but in clinical experience, we still see the leak rates are, are still a problem, right? So that's something that, that we got to think about. So let's look at the Swiss APRO data. In the, in the Swiss APRO data, um, they described their endpoint was patency of the left atrial appendage. More than 65% of patients in both the amulet as well as the Watchman flex, right? You have to remember about 75% of these patients in the Watchman group actually had Watchman flex and 25% actually had the old Watchman 2.5 version. More than 65% of patients in both the groups had patency into the left atrial appendage as defined by CT scan findings. 
So this is kind of where all the confusion comes from, all these different colors. And when we really separate out the wheat from the shaft, what you see here is 26.7% of the patients who actually have the amulet had peri device leaks, and about 48% of the patients who had the Watchman Flex device, majority of them are Watchman Flex device, actually has had peri device leaks. And when you really run a quick statistical two by two analysis, that p value is definitely significant, right? So, over analyzing data that is complicated, irrelevant, it makes actually things worse. When, when this paper came out, people were, oh my God, left atrial appendage closure devices don't work, there are a lot of leaks, and they really don't make sense. And if you really separate the wheat from the shaft, the wheat is only 26.7% versus 48%. And that is no different than the experience that we had so far, whether it is Watchman 2.5 or Watchman Flex. So I'm actually surprised that 48% of Watchman Flex devices actually had reasonable leaks, leaks that are relevant, right? Three millimeters or less or, 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 or around that, right? So that is something that I, I really wanted to point it out and we really analyze this data. Let's look at another study, the seal flex, right? Again, study raked up so much controversy in a very short period of time. I'm still surprised why it never came out in publication. So this study came out and showed that 69.5% of the patients in amylet arm versus 27.4% actually had a complete, I mean, had a PDL at eight weeks per CT scan. This suffers from the same over analysis of irrelevant data. And when you really look at this peri device leaks, right? And, and added up everything. Number one, the numbers don't really add up. The definition of leaks is based on contrast permeation and not real leaks, right? Again, we know that mere contrast permeation without any peri device leaks means lack of endothelialization, allowing for the contrast to flow through which has no implication on strokes and which has no implication on BRT, which has no implication on any other clinical outcomes. When you crunch these numbers, it doesn't really quite add up, right? So you have 69.5% versus 27.4. And when you add up these, it's 74.16%. .4 when you really take out, separate out the wheat from the shaft, you take out the so-called in contrast going through that, and you take out the so-called um, contrast in the lobe, and what really matters is what is left. The people who have contrast around the device was actually much lower in the amylid device than it is with the Watchman Flex, 10% versus 16%. And then compare that to this fearful number of 69.5% versus 27.4%. It makes absolutely no sense, bro. So what this goes to tell you is it all depends on how you look at the data. And when you really carefully analyze this data, the truth comes out and there is really no meaning to this particular paper. So I just want to kind of highlight to this. So let's look at um, different anatomic variations, right? So we have this dual lobe appendages. You have a very large appendage. You have appendages that have proximal lobes, deep trabeculations. All of this still continue to pose a problem to the Watchman Flex as they did to the Watchman 2.5 version, right? It's, it's more malleable. It adjusts itself a little better. We're doing a better job at it because we're more experienced with it. The device is more compliant. It helps us answer some of these questions. But these issues of dual lobes, deep trabeculations, proximal lobes, very large left atrial appendage, it doesn't go away. And the leaks that are related to that still continue to be a problem. So we need to figure out a way of how to answer that. So let's do a little sort of a cartoon issue of this, right? So you have an appendage that looks like this with a deep proximal lobe. And you put in a device, you have a big leak, and you say, okay, let's upsize this device and let's come back out a little bit and deploy it a little more proximally. And at implantation, it looks like it looked great. It has nice approximation. There's no now flow going through on TEE. 
You bring them back at six weeks and do a TE, all of a sudden, there's a bit of a rotation of the device. And then what looked like it closed, now it opened up. And that exactly happens time and time again with these devices, uh, with the orientation being tilted and gone. When you create a big overhang, yes, it works. And a lot of times I end up doing this because I'm worried about this particular scenario happening way too frequently. So let's show uh, an example of this, right? This is a, a good example of, is this a PDL or is it an IDL, right? You clearly see most of the um, watchman device is thrombosed off. There is really nothing there. There's a little bit of a, a small leak around. And this is a true PDL because what is happening here is a leak that's going through that. And then the entire appendage will closure device is nicely thrombosed off. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples and then I'm gonna hand it over to Swiss. So this is an example of how a similar looking appendage and what you would do with an amulet device, right? So what you do here is you deploy an appendage closure device. I think some of the drawings are missing from the, uh, somehow they're gone, I can't, I don't know why. So in this particular case, you deploy the device in a little too deep, it is misaligned, you have a large crest here, and the um, disc is not really helping you. And then here you have a helmet-shaped deployment with too much of a stress, which oftentimes exerts a lot of shearing radial forces and really sets you up for microperforation and delayed pericardial effusions. That's something not acceptable. You pull the load back a little bit, and it's still not proximal enough it's still a little off axis and really creating an overhang and this is the suboptimal position. So a scenario like this where you can come a little more proximally in the right landing zone and you have a properly aligned lobe and a desk, you get the best possible outcome with the best possible closure. This is something that one has to really uh, pay attention to and something that I think Chris is gonna show in several of these examples. As I was alluding to earlier, the concept of leak and the connection between systemic embolic events is poorly understood. And this paper still doesn't really quite make any sense because if somebody has significant leaks, why is it that they're not having enough thromboembolic events, right? Again, um, more PDLs in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. This is something that uh, uh, we are sort of reasonably aware of. And the most recent paper from um, uh, Chris Ellis's group a uh, very nice paper that really redefines and helped us move this trend of shooting for a better closure, right? Three millimeters is better than five millimeters. When you have leaks that are more than three millimeters, yes, there is an, an increased risk of events. And a lot of physicians are not willing to let these things go and they want to close this because they understand no leak is better than any leak. And that's kind of how the notion of at least leaning on a three millimeter leak is something that one has to think about. So let's look at this particular example. Right? So this is a one, young lady that we closed. She's only 74, but she looks 55. And we put an amulet device in her. And what you see here is a large, gnarly looking appendage. Here is the disc, here is the lobe. This is again, the same thing in a the red arrow indicates the, the disc. And looking at this, you would say that appendage is not closed, right? So let's look from inside and see what exactly happened here. This appendage is beautifully closed. There is no visible leak around. There is merely flow of contrast through this device that's lighting up that entire appendage. There is zero leak, right? If you went by this definition, oh my God, this appendage is not really closed and the sky is falling, right? This is again, the same patient, nice closure. This is the disc that completely occludes the appendage, that's a lobe, and then you have contrast flowing through that. Let's look at a different case. This is a case of a patient that we did on the same day where you actually have appendage light up and you the, there is space between the disc and the wall, there is a space between the lobe and the wall. This was a very difficult appendage with acute angulation, and after much trial and error, we were able to get this in place. But as you clearly see here, 
there is no proper alignment between the lobe and the disc, and that's exactly what the problem is. Sometimes this is something that you have to deal with because you may not be able to get how much ever you try the alignment that you really seek in these particular cases. There are other uses for amulet. When you have a large stump left behind after an atrial clip, you can beautifully close it off with an amulet closure device and uh, getting a perfect closure there. So I would like to summarize by saying that work on proper technique, understand there are two separate different devices and the amulet occluder with the dual seal mechanism has the ability to treat a wide range of anatomies and understand the difference between a true leak and lack of endothelialization and these two tools show two different types of data and contrast behind the disc or lobe without a true gap is irrelevant to any outcomes. Thank you very much. And Chris is gonna educate us more on some of the techniques and other things that um, he's facile with. DJ, thanks, that was fantastic. Chris, uh, show us how to put this in the right way. <laughs> All right, that's a... Uh... That's great, I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna go ahead and discuss a little bit about some strategies for placing the device successfully. And I think um, the previous talk is a very good setup for, you know, really like don't, there's no reason you should leave an amulet device with a peri device leak. Sometimes the anatomy is just brutal and we all do struggle with that. But if you take a little time, reposition the device, it's easy to reposition get it coaxial, you should have a complete seal uh, with no peri device leak. So I'm gonna go over just some of the, like the techniques for how I usually implant this. This schematic kind of shows the blue arrow on the top right image, like where the lobe contacts the neck of the left atrium, uh, left atrial appendage is a little bit deeper than kind of where you draw your line for measurement of placement of the watchman device. But the disc will sit out quite a bit more proximal. So for some people, I think a little bit of a challenge has been switching from doing watchman's to amulet. They'll have this tendency to want to bury the amulet device deep. And it will sometimes look like it's really proximal and it's actually the perfect position for the device. Um, so. For access, I mean, one of just basics of LAA occlusion, of course, reduce probability of any um, vascular complication using ultrasound. I've generally done all my amulets still with uh, TEE guidance. Uh, I do a fair number of flex with ice. I've honestly found, as I've been following those patients, it's probably 150 or so, a pretty decent number of them have still had peri device leak by similar mechanisms, to, I think, to the Watchman 2.5. Less problematic, I mean, a little bit smaller, but still frequent occurrence. I'd like to not see that. Um, so I'm actually switching back most of my, I think some of it's the ICE guidance. I, I, I'm switching back to doing TEE for the majority of my cases uh, with both devices. Uh, we usually do general anesthesia. You want to target that left atrial pressure over 10, exclude thrombus, and keep the ACT over 250 before delivering the device. Um, you have to be a little bit more attentive, I think, to the valve, the sheath, and the duration of which you have uh, the device like inside the sheath, if there's any you know bleed back and you're just sitting there for a while without deploying it or waiting, um, you know, it's like you could get throm little thrombi form inside the sheath or on the hardware. There's a lot more of it. It's a more dense device than the Watchman. Um, it's kind of like two devices. Um, generally, we're planning for adapt after implant. So, you, you know, we just hold the NOAC the morning of the procedure, anticipating that by the next morning, basically the drug will have washed out. So there's been some debate about that in terms of the pericardial effusion concerns. And my general plan is keep them thin until they come in, stop the drug that morning, switch to DAPT, and then you know home they go without uh, further systemic anticoagulation. The sizing of the device, I really like doing a pre-procedure CT, uh, but intraoperatively we're using, of course, TEE. So we always have to negotiate a little bit between the two imaging modalities about which one we're going to use for the ultimate sizing of the device. Uh, but generally, you can cover from a landing zone measurement of 11 millimeters up to 31 millimeters uh, with the available um, eight different amulet sizes. Most sticks for the transeptal, I use a Versacross sheath uh, and go pretty much mid or a little bit mid anterior. Uh, 
on the 45 degree view, but always inferior, like as low as low on the septum as I can. Uh, that always helps uh, positioning the device. And the real key to amulet is putting the lobe coaxial to your landing zone. If you do that, you'll have basically a stable device and four layers of device to help occlude the appendage pretty quickly. Um, so I'm going to go over one case in a bit about uh, an off-axis device and why that's important to take the time to reposition it. Here's an example of our TEE measurement uh, angles for amulet. And it's definitively different than Watchman. You can see the red line is basically my landing zone. In this particular case, the landing zone measurements go from 17.1 up to 22.6. That's actually relatively round. You know, this is a 25, 28 millimeter device size. Um, 22 is probably too small, but it might actually be okay. So you can often have multiple devices that'll fit for the measured um, landing zone. But in general, we're trying to stick to the measurements pretty closely in terms of sizing and not, you know, just generously oversize every device that we put in. Um, the yellow arrows indicate the true ostium from the tip of the tumor and ridge to the sort of mitral valve annulus aspect of the LNA orifice, and that's where the disc will sit. In between, of course, there's a space that separates. In an ideal amulet device, you'll have a gap in between the disc and the lobe that is evident by fluoro uh, and by TEE, and that's partly due to um, tension between the distal aspect of the anchoring mechanism of the lobe and the proximal aspect of the cup of concave disc in the left atrial wall. When you separate that out and stretch it out, of course, there's, as DJ has mentioned, there'll still be some permeability of contrast through that, but it's not a embolic stroke risk uh, in terms of like thrombus coming out of the LAA. When we navigate the device, um, pretty comparable, I think, Flex. You know, I basically park the sheath close to the ostium of the LAA, load the device, unsheath for the ball position. Um, and then from the ball position, that's sort of your navigating position. So again, the red line is sort of my land, is the landing zone. You can see where the circumflex is. It's like a landing zone. That's a, if you put a watchman there, you'd say, oh, it's probably a little deep. But that's, that's the target for where we want the lobe to anchor. Um, and in this situation, you know, you would try to navigate as best you can right to the center of the appendage. That's best done in the 135 view on TEE. So that's another reason I really like sticking with the TEE for implant on amulet is using the 135 view. You can really help uh, optimize the probability of a coaxial uh, lobe deployment. Once we put the lobe out here, if you look on the top left, that's sort of the ideal shape moderate compression, a little bit off axis of the distal pin from the neck of the uh, amulet and a nicely concave disc. Uh, bottom left uh, panel C is also acceptable. I like that a lot. That's the barrel shape. And we'll generally like target somewhere in between the two of those as our visual cues that we have a nice uh, placed lobe with a good amount of compression. And uh, one of the key things I like to measure is the height of the compressed lobe versus the width. And once you get on the two right side uh, images, the length of the lobe is beyond the width of the lobe. That's probably too compressed. And that likely needs to be repositioned. It's either subselected some distal part of the LAA or small lobe, or it's just too big of a device uh, and you need to downsize. Um, so, so the two on the right, I would reposition uh, potentially, because I think the lobe is too compressed. The two on the left, that looks appropriate. Repositioning is not difficult. On this uh, example, we have a nice little bare metal stent, probably like a two millimeter stent uh, in that circumflex. So it's a good marker for um, the orientation of, of where our landing zone is, is, is targeting. At first, this lobe looks a little bit off axis. You can see it's sort of tilted. So we just pull the cable in with the sheath up at the lobe, pull it back to the ball position. And more times I've watched this, I can actually see the anchors fold over right to the edge of the sheath right there. 
that's when the anchors have disengaged and now you can freely uh, you know, rotate, advance and reposition uh, to your target location. I think um, when you get to that position, this is sort of uh, ultimately exactly how you want the device to look. It's not always gonna look this way, uh, but this is a very good uh, compression of the lobe. Again, the pin and the neck are, are in a different uh, orientation from each other. The disc is cupped and it's uh, concave and there's nice separation, really nice separation between the lobe and the disc. I think when you see that, when you release that disc and it cups and pulls back tight to the LAA, I, there's like no probability that that's gonna leak. Now, in terms of a true, true peri device leak, it may take time for it to endothelialize all the way, but you won't leave a leak uh, that's relevant. This case, these, these are examples of where the disc, when the disc is released, uh, if it tucks under the Coumadin ridge too far, uh, and these I've measured the angle somewhere between sort of that 30 to 60 degree range, it may be setting up a small area where there's really stagnant flow uh, on the edge of the disc and could potentiate a possibility for a DRT or a device-related thrombus. So another reason to reposition other than on... Uh, or overcompressed lobe would be a disc that tucks in here with a real sharp angle. Sometimes you can't avoid this, just, just depending on where the landing zone can be. Uh, but often if you move back proximal, or even if you, sometimes if you get lucky, you can just pull the cable in your football test, do a little, uh, a little orientation adjustment with the sheath and get the disc to land on the Coumadin ridge. And then when you release it, hopefully it will stay put. Uh, but if you stretch it too far, it's going to try to pull back down to this position. So in that situation, you probably need to move the lobe itself uh, a bit more proximal. Um, let's go to the next slide here. There we go. So keys to a, a successful uh, implant. Again, sheath alignment is key. So if you go in your transeptal stick and immediately, like, you can't get this view on a, say, this is a schematic I just sketched of a 135 TE view. If you're way off axis, you're going to have to probably restick. So number one, don't hesitate to restick. Don't hesitate to reposition the lobe. Maybe steerable sheath can help in some situations where you get an optimal transeptal stick, but you still have a real difficult time getting aligned to the landing zone. That may end up being very helpful. Again, sizing, don't oversize uh, 30%. That will be way too big for the amulet. Uh, once you're in the, the we've met, we've talked about navigating in the ball position, but then when you're at your target location, you want to hold the sheath still, and then you push out cable till the triangle shape forms. And then if you need another, you know, millimeter or two of depth, that's a pretty safe shape of the system to be able to just lean forward on all components and advance cable until the lobe is deployed. We'll take a look at a case here, and then uh, I think we'll have a little Q and A uh, session. So this is a, a, a left atrial appendage closure I did with a 22 millimeter amulet device. A gentleman who's in an atypical flutter after avionodal ablation, he'd had AFib as his principal uh, arrhythmia, and uh, ultimately had kind of a rocky course. He's got a Chaz Vasca five and a Hasblet of four. Baseline CT was actually from his pre-ablation, so it was about three years old, uh, but it still matched pretty well with our intraoperative TE. He has here what you can see is like this proximal posterior lobe uh, coming off just beyond um, the orifice of the LAA. And then it actually narrows down in the mid portion of the appendage uh, and then has its usual like complex architecture distal. We measured the landing zone on this case is very elliptical. So this is 12 millimeters uh, by 20 millimeters. And that situation is gonna be a little bit tricky on sizing in general, if you get something that's really elliptical, the, the widest measurement you take, so here 20 millimeters, you know, that might be the size of the device. You, you, you may go uh, with a 22, but you probably won't want to put a 25 in this. it will be way too big, given that the other dimension is 12 uh, millimeters. And here's, uh, here's sort of our measurements at baseline. You can see it's real, really slender in one angle, but reasonably wide in the other angle. Um, but it has a nice spot to, to drop the disc. So we felt like this is going to close perfectly if we can get the lobe to um, orient properly. 
you can see a circumflex coronary artery stent again because <laughs> I have a series of these patients. Um, they're good for uh, teaching purposes. And you can see that when in the left view, uh, the marker band of the sheath is kind of right at where that posterior lobe comes off. And so you have to make this, this decision, like where is this lobe going to sit? Is it going to slide into that uh, posterior lobe? It may turn it sideways a little bit. Are you going to anchor it way deep? We don't really want to put it too deep and end up with that uh, sharp angle in the cuminant ridge. We want it to stay up high on the ridge. Uh, but you can see the schematic drawings down below, pretty much where like the red line is kind of not where I want to put it. And if you size to that spot, you're going to be picking a pretty large device uh, compared to the optimal landing zone. The uh, yellow line is sort of like where we want to put this device. So in the first go in the, in the top left corner, you'll see I go from triangle, again, leaning forward, advancing cable. It goes to a helmet-like position, and then the back of the lobe actually retracts forward, so it moves like right there, and then boom, moves forward. That's in the top left panel. Anytime you see that, I, I don't like that. With the lo like the lobe, when it, when the lobe gets trapped, it should just be still. Uh, if you put the lobe out, and then like a second or two later, you see the thing move, it's not really going to be a stable position. And then when I do the angiogram in the bottom left, I really think that for for all your early implants and when you start doing this, very very nice and an important thing to learn from. Once you place the lobe go ahead and do a shot through the sheath before you put the disc out. In this situation, on the bottom left panel, you can see that part of that lobe pulled into the posterior uh, aspect of that appendage lobe. And it's kind of like a tough thing. It's the amulet lobe and the appendage lobe, two separate things. Uh, but there's tons of contrast. Like the contrast just flies right through the device. It's like not even close to occlus to occlusive. The lobe itself should be pretty occlusive. When you have it in the right position, you shouldn't see a ton of contrast go through it unless you're injecting really hard. When I put the disc out on this as well in the top right video, you can see again that the lobe moves further out when I put the disc out. And so that's like another, that's almost a stronger tension test than anything. It's probably putting, once you put the disc out, a lot of times the unstable lobe will declare itself, uh, I would say, at that point. So again, we recapture him and go back in and again we're going to try to target just a little bit more proximal location to get this lobe to pinch between where you can see the circle my bottom right diagram straight across to the lobe and you can see that the top right video this looks this is the same device okay but it looks distinctly different when it opens up boom it's squeezed nice it's got that moderate compression not a helmet or barrel shape and it's right uh, smack at the landing zone. So that's a good stable position. And we go ahead and complete, and go through our maneuvers and close signs, and we see really nice position of the disc in the top right panel where we're touching the tip of the cumin and ridge down to the mitral valve and not interfering with the mitral valve apparatus. The lobe is very coaxial to our landing zone and uh, looks completely sealed. There's no flow around that uh, on any view. So in our release, again, I like to see the disc snap back towards the uh, lobe when we let it go. And there we go. And the lobe is open, you know, or the disc is open. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's stretched because it's being pulled from underneath by the anchoring mechanism of the amulet lobe. And that will keep the disc from being a flat pancake, but more like uh, a little bit elliptical, as you can see it in the top right image and the, and the accompanying 3D uh, TEE view there is uh, always nice to see at the end uh, where we can identify the mitral valve and make sure that we're not uh, anywhere near, you know, pinching that. I'll have to say, though, most of the time when you see the way the mitral valve opens, you're not really, the amulet, even if it's a big disc, it's not really going to land on the part of the valve that would affect its function. It's sort of at the side of the mouth um, rather than on one of the leaflets. So in, in summary on achieving successful implant, um, certainly uh, I'd like to have the pre-procedure imaging. I think it's extremely helpful with Amulet. Uh, a lot of folks I know don't do pre-procedure imaging uh, and just kind of get the mystery meat appendage and deal with it on the table. 
Uh, most of the time that's, that's okay, but I think sometimes it can get you into trouble. Um, and I just don't like to mess with that. So I don't want to abort cases. I like to have everybody that gets put on the table have a successful implant, ideally. Um, navigating to the ball through the ball position in the 135 to center up to your landing zone is the most important uh, portion of really the implant. Once that lobe is anchored properly and you do an angiogram through the lobe and see minimal flow, the rest of the device should deploy itself almost, I mean, pretty easily. Uh, usually unsheath about two thirds of the disc and then let the last little bit of the disc fall out uh, with minimal uh, pressure on the cable and just kind of let it pull towards the appendage. Um, but I would say that in general, like as we've discussed earlier, really I feel from what I've seen on follow-ups now, probably 150 patients or so, uh, a true peri device leak with amulet is really rare unless you have placed the lobe uh, way off axis. And, and that's the one thing that really will get you. So uh, I think making an effort to avoid that um, will pay off uh, in the long run. So thank you. And I think we'll turn back over to, to James. All right. Uh, that was fantastic, uh, Chris and TJ. Those were just terrific uh, talks. Uh, let's just, Chris, I'm just going to, we'll talk a little bit about the procedure itself. And I think you really gave the best practices. Um, and uh, that was terrific. You know, early um, in any uh, experience with devices, and we saw this with uh, Watchmen, and we saw in the Pivotal trial uh, with, you know, very early experience, there were a few pericardial fusions. Could you just uh, kind of address that? Uh, you know, what do you think ways to avoid that? I think you showed us how to put an amulet in the right way, but any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that's a, an important question. It comes up a lot. Um, I don't think that the numbers are always quite the, as bad as they seem to get presented, but definitely early learning experience with a bunch of people that are used to burying a sheath down in the tip of the appendage and putting a Watchman 2.5 in, that probably just that pattern, that behavior, I think the, the muscle memory of that may have set up some of those earlier fusions. And some of, uh, you know, just like learning how to size this thing, not sizing it like, <laughs> I can remember, remember Seibel Carr basically saying like, you're going to put a 33 device in like literally anything that he could get his sheath into. And that's really not what, how amulet works. You know, I think I showed like in that one case where the lobe is a little off axis, so I just pulled that back, didn't resize, and I get a totally different shape of the lobe just by repositioning it to where the forces around the lobe are, you know, proper and sort of perpendicular to the axis of the lobe. That's going to really grab in pretty tight. The stabilizing anchors are, you know, a bit longer reach than with Watchmen. I have seen a couple of cases and, you know, it just was kind of a mystery, but that have had a late effusion. I haven't had to re I haven't had to do anything other than drain that before. Like it just stops. Um, all those patients were on DAPT, uh, you know, which is just, I think, pretty much what we're doing with all the amulet implants. It's the same as it was in the IDE trial. Um, but like, I haven't had to do any surgery on these at all it's just kind of like maybe a slow ooze sometimes and it doesn't always show up right away i don't know maybe dj can comment on his pattern of um like commercial implants now are you doing a surface echo on everybody you know before discharge whether that's same day or the next morning uh and then what do you do with that information um you know you really are you going to change the regimen or put them on colchicine or or, or what be, i'd be curious to hear I, I still do an echo. I mean, routinely, um, I think it's, it's just a good practice. Uh, and that also standardizes the procedural follow-ups for everybody on the team because throughout our organization in Metro KC, we have seven implanters, right? And not everybody has the same level of experience and comfort with these devices. So, um, and that's the reason why we will... Uh, we will do the echoes. I think to your point, Chris, multiple redeployments, I think is a major problem. So appropriate sizing, knowing your anatomy ahead of time is better. And, 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 uh, and also the technique people use to get the 
low back into the sheath, I think, is very critical. I mean, you you showed it very beautifully how the traction counter traction mechanism to really put, gently pulling those anchors back in is the key. And, and many times people just pull it back, and they're used to this uh, Watchman Flex device, so they have to remember that this is not a flex device; it's a it's an amulet, and it behaves differently. So. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I think I, I think point, I think people point, people, people tend pull. to get that ball too too deep, and then and then they'll they'll start to rotate this with the anchors not really pulled up. I mean, they're in a triangle and they're they're, they're rotating, and you know that's bad. Yeah, um, when you pull that back, you really want to get that to almost a tight ball, before, and then and then it'll loosen up. But otherwise, sometimes you get the anchors caught in there, and you're sort of dragging the appendage while you're trying to move the move the device. Um, let, let me just ask uh, both of you another question. DJ, you can start this off. Uh, just a great kind of review on leaks. Um, given that Amulet, um, you know, only requires DAPT, a um, couple questions about follow-up of these patients. Do you still just do a 45-day look? Do you do a three-month look as your first look? Um, and then two, um, are you doing that follow-up look with CT or with TEE these days? So uh, I haven't changed my <clears throat> practice to three months yet uh, because we started this uh, follow-up registry for all of our patients, both the TE and CT. So we do a CT or TE at uh, six weeks, um, 90, I mean, six months and at 12 months routinely uh, uh, because it just gives us such valuable data that we, we, could, um, we, could, we could use. Um, in terms of whether CT or TE, uh, if there is a patient that comes from a TE operator who's part of the appendage team and they would like to do TEs on these people, I, I, I go ahead and order TEs on these patients. And rest of the people we use CTs uh, pretty widely, uh, especially elderly patients and patients where we don't really want to put them under general anesthesia and the issues of um, um, superficial strictures and stuff. Uh, so CT has been very helpful, but then I had to educate my CT yeah. readers quite a bit because of the craziness that comes out of it in how they interpret these images. So. Yes, yes. Yeah, you get everybody's got a leak, right? And they don't. They don't have a meaningful <laughs> leak. Um, and uh, Chris, I think, you know, you and your paper, um, uh, uh, at FSL uh, and you, um, and kind of the follow-up of patients that do have a leak, um, any difference with Amulet compared to uh, Watchmen in terms of if you do find a leak, although it's very uncommon you find a leak with an Amulet? Yeah, I think, well, based on, like, I think that one uh, picture that DJ showed where there's like, the, I have like a little schematic in this latex mm -hmm. model with the Watchmen, and, and you can see how the crescentic nature of that leak um, is sort of, you have to kind of glue it closed with coils. You can't really access that kind of leak in an amulet if it's under the disc at the lobe, which is, of course, the, probably the leak that really matters. Most of these little edge leaks, I've actually seen several cases, and I think this is a nice point to one of the anatomic questions I saw in the, in the chat box. When you have a lot of irregularity to the Coumadin ridge and there's all these little pits along the edge of it, you know, the disc, when it's first deployed, of course, is it's sliding along the wall of the left atrium under, you know, constant cardiac contraction. It's not actually like glued closed from the get-go. So sometimes you'll see just that sliding along the Coumadin Ridge side will open up like little, you'll see a little flow around the disc. And most of those that I've seen at most of my follow-ups are, are 90 days for the post implant. When they come back at one year, it's gone. It's really interesting. So, the little inter-device leak around the disc on Amulet, I think the difference is it'll seal itself off as the device continues to sort of fibrose from underneath and then gradually stops moving, and then the walls can endothelialize, right? So if it's constantly mobile, you can always have a little bit of flow picked up um, on TE or CT. And then um, I think just I haven't had to do any peri device leak closure with amulet but it's i can't say that i don't have any that i would think about it on but it was like not i just i don't have any experience with it it doesn't seem to be the main issue um yeah. the main issue is just 
like at implant, do you get it, put it where you want it? And if you do, it's mostly not going to be a problem down the road. What, one thing I think DJ probably can also appreciate is like sometimes you put a flex in, it looks perfect at implant. And then like they come back at three months and they've got a leak and you're like, there's nothing you would have done differently at implant. It's just sort of like as the device remodels and the, and the atrium changes and maybe the device just sort of contours a little bit over time little cracks open up and you, and you see the flow but you don't see it at implant so good so just a All couple questions from your audience um and then we'll probably wrap this up uh there's questions about what do you do with cardioversion you've got somebody with uh, an ambulance at six months so do you put them back on anticoagulation what do you do All right, i'll take that one we we published a paper on that issue. So anytime you have somebody in front of you that you want a cardioward, you should always worry about the possibility of a big leak and the possibility of a promise on the device, right? So uh, our recommendation is do a TEE and make sure there is no thrombus and there is no large leak. And if, especially if somebody has a large leak and a big thrombus behind the device, even though the thrombus may not be on the device, then you are embarking on a potential risk of embolization in this patient. So when you don't have any of these and it's relatively clean, uh, you can actually cardioward the patient without any anticoagulation. We have done it many ways. We cardioverted patients uh, by giving them anticoagulation and kept them on anticoagulation for four weeks. We cardioverted patients without anything and followed them with absolutely no issues. So. We are pretty comfortable to say that if you don't have a significant leak and if there's no DRT uh, on TE, cardioward them, and you may just be fine not anticoagulate them at all. That's at least our practice, and, and, and we have done a lot of these cases like that, and we have no problems. All right. Well, this is going to be the last uh, question, um, and it's about anatomy. What, what, what anatomy is Chris, amulet versus watchman, and, you know, you, you get the final word. <laughs> I'll say the one, so this is interesting. In Circ A&E, like I remember reviewing this article and, and now looking back and reading it, it's really relevant. And I see this more since we've closed all the windsocks in the world, right? The swan, the swan LAA anatomy, which is sort of like has two dominant bends, I think is like, I've seen this now several cases where I worked really hard with Flex to get it. I ended up have, having to reposition it like, a bunch of different ways and it was really tough to get that proximal neck to sit flush and i have several of these where it looked great at implant and then i have a, a leak along the cumin and ridge side and so um one specific anatomy it's is, is the swan and you have to look that up if you're not like familiar with it because it's not the classic chicken wing windsock morphology description but it actually looks like that's also the appendage anatomy that has the highest um, observed stroke risk. So uh, the amulet works, I think, great in that because you can kind of just go into the proximal part, anchor the lobe, and the, and the disc does help you a lot when the proximal anatomy of the appendage is really complex. I think, you know, if you get a disc to cup down over all that whole surface, it's really going to close off nice and you won't have to worry about, did I leave this really irregular saccular structure along the cumin and ridge or some proximal uh, post posterior lobe uncovered um, all of that gets uh, dealt with with a tight um, seal on the disc so that's okay. that's one anatomy at least that i've seen it's quite useful for all right well i want to thank you too that was just uh, fantastic uh, information terrific presentations i think yeah, very instructive instructive. Uh, the webinar, uh, again, you can get this offline once this is all done and review. And uh, thank you all for attending and everybody have a great evening. Thanks again.